Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you how you can properly validate that you register your services in your dependency injection container without having to worry that the application will blow up on your face when you deploy it. This is ultimately a shortcoming of having a DI container that is fully runtime based, but there are several steps you can take to prevent this from ever happening to you. I'm also going to show you a pretty unique solution that I came up with to handle this problem once and for all. If you like the above content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe, ring the notification bell, and for more training, check out nickchapsters.com. Alright, so let me show you what I have here. I have a simple weather API, the same bog standard API that comes out when you build the web API in .NET, but I've actually structured this a bit differently. So in here I have my weather controller, same model, but now I have an I service which I'm injecting there and that has the same logic. So it uses a nice system clock to generate the date time now or the UTC now that is being offset in the dates. But the main logic is the same. We have five weather forecasts being generated over here. Now this looks fine and the code absolutely compiles. If I go ahead, as you can see, nothing wrong with it. I'm going to go ahead and run it and just show you how the application works. I'm going to go here and just call it. Whoops. So as you can see, and this is the main problem we're looking at, this application just ran absolutely fine. There was no problem running the API. However, as you can see, I got an error. And the error is that I actually never registered that iWeather service. When I developed it, I just forgot to register it in the DI container. And that will be something here in the program.cs. So I do have my iSystem clock, but I don't have the weather service. Now, of course, if I went ahead and I did that, then that wouldn't be a problem. We're going to stop it, restart it, and then try to call it again, and then it will work fine. But ultimately, this is a problem of having a fully runtime-based DI container. And the obvious solution would be, hey, you should have integration tests to catch this, but you might not. Now, in reality, you should, and I do have a course on that on nickchapsters.com, but actually, wouldn't be amazing if you could just validate this sort of behavior, that you at least have properly registered the dependencies that you want to have registered with the correct service type, implementation type, and lifetime. Now, I'm going to show you how you can do that, but I do want to raise a few things first. See how this application failed only when I called the endpoint, when I commented out this weather service? Well, here's the thing. If the weather service existed, but the system clock did not exist, and I went ahead and I run it, then as you can see, this fails on startup, and it doesn't even start. This is a bit of a special case, and I actually think this behavior has changed. I don't think it was like this from the beginning. And the reason why I say that is because to get that experience, you actually had to do builder.host or web host, depending on which host you're using, and then use the use default service provider here with the options and then you have to configure options.validate on build equals true which is a bit of a weird name as well because it says validate on build but it actually means building of the container not building the project so if i just build the project everything will work but when the time comes to build the container here that's what it means and only then it would actually fail in that way now i want to re-emphasize that even if you have this check here it doesn't fail if the service you're injecting is actually in the controller. And that is because controllers by default are not really registered as services that can handle this sort of validation. So anything that is injected in them won't really be validated. There used to be a way to get around this by actually having the add controllers as services method, but this doesn't seem to exist anymore in the new way of building APIs. There might be a way to bring it back in, but I'm going to show you why you don't need to use this approach anyway. I should, however, mention this if you're using this approach, so it is still error prone. So now it looks like this behavior is enabled by default, even though hovering over this parameter, it says that the default parameter is false, which is a bit weird because we are getting that experience in .NET 7. Now, there's actually another parameter you can enable here, and that is the validate scopes. And that just ensures that scoped services are not resolved by the root provider. Now, you could also use another overload here if you want more configuration. For example, you can still have your options, but you can also have this, which is really your host context. So if you want to only validate for development environment, for example, you can do something like this, where you say, yeah, validate if we're development, because this sort of validation on a startup will take some time and you might want very fast startups, but know that you can do that. 
However, this is not what I really want to be focusing on for a few reasons. Like I said, this doesn't work with controllers. This doesn't work if you use the from services attribute to inject things on the endpoint level over here. It also doesn't work if you directly try to resolve something from the iService provider. Also, if you use a factory and you instantiate something in there and not through the container, this is also not checked. And last but not least, open generics are also not checked. What we mean by open generics is that if I wanted to register, for example, this uh, logger adapter over here, you, which uses a t-type parameter, and I want to do it in an open generics fashion, which would mean I have to do this, add singleton type of i logger adapter, so I can actually have this open, and that's the main idea. Right, let me just quickly finish this, so something like this, then this is also not supported for these types of registration. So it's really, really limited. So back to the original problem, something like this, even though it is absolutely wrong, we will not know about it until it's deployed and someone calls the endpoint, giving them a really bad experience. So you have to take down the service and try to fix it. But how can we fix this? Well, there's many ways you can, and there's been a few that are now a bit obsolete, but I'm going to show you one that I came up with and works really, really well. But before that, let me tell you about the sponsor of this video, the ABP.io framework. The ABP framework is an open source platform that you can use to create modern web applications following the latest best practices and conventions of software development. It supports multiple architectures from microservices to modular systems and from domain-driven design to multi-tenant applications. It provides ready solutions for problems such as authentication and authorization, and you can either use the Getting Started Web Wizard or the ABP CLI tool to create .NET projects exactly how you want them. They also provide commercial solutions with access to extra modules, themes, and templates alongside premium support for enterprise users. It is a complete package that solves most of the problems you will encounter while building a system out of the box. To find out more about ABP, check the link in the description. Alright, so how do we solve this issue? Well, let me show you my approach. I have this test project over here, and it's just a simple project using any unit this time, and I'm going to explain why I choose any unit here and not X unit, which is normally my preference. Now, for this to work, I actually have to go ahead and turn this project into an SDK.web project, and I also have to add an extra NuGet package, and that is the MVC.testing. So, Microsoft.ASP.NetCore.MVC.Testing. And the reason why I do that is because I need access to the Web Application Factory class. Now, if you don't know what the Web Application Factory class is, it allows us to create an in-memory version of our application and get back an in-memory HTTP client to call it so we can effectively integration test it. But the approach I'm going to show you is more of a functional test rather than an integration test. And the reason for that is because we're never going to really run the API. Let me show you. I'm going to go back to the dependency test class and in this test case, I'm going to create my web application factory. So I'm going to say app equals new web application factory. And now you can point at any type within the web API project. Usually what I do is I create an assembly marker. So I'm going to say I API marker is just an empty interface. You might want to add a comment to say, do not delete this. This is used for assembly scanning. So I'm going to just leave this here and say I API marker. And now I'm going to use the with web host builder method over here. The reason why I'm going to do that is because it gives me access to the configure test services method. And this is where the magic happens. So let me just show you how we're going to approach this. I'm going to say service collection. And these are all the services. But what's very special about them is that at this point, the point of this call, what's going to happen is the code will start running, register everything, and that call will be called during the build time. And then I don't need the rest because all the registration actually happens before that. Meaning that at this point, I have all the services, or actually all the service definitions. So it defines how the services are supposed to be registered and how they're supposed to be resolved, but they're not materialized yet. So any startup that they have won't run, which means I don't have to do any mocking here. I just get the service descriptors. And my logic here will be very, very simple. All I'm going to say is var result equals validate services, and I'm going to pass down the services, and the result will have two parameters. First, whether it was successful or not, and then a message. So I can actually let the user know what was the problem with the registration. So I'm going to say, if result wasn't success, which doesn't exist, but we're going to create it, then assert.fail, and that is an any unit method. And in here, I'm going to say result.message, which I'm going to create. And outside of that, I'm going to say assert.fail, 
pass. What pass will do is actually internally throw an exception that any unit knows to handle and effectively cancel the test early. This means that we're going to reach build and succeed or fail before we ever run the API. Meaning it's going to be very fast. We're going to get all the services at this point to validate and then we're going to exit early. The class we're going to use for validation will look like this. We're just going to have a Boolean called success and a string called message to actually return when we fail. Now, the next thing I'm going to need, except for this method, which I'm going to show you in a second, is to actually create a list of all the service descriptors defining what I want to validate. Because maybe you don't want to validate everything in your DI container, but as you add things, you can also add an entry here. So what I'm going to do in this case is just create a list like this, which is just a tuple, which has a list of a type, which is the service type, the main bit, the in this case, the interface, then the implementation type, which could be nullable. And then you have the lifetime singleton, transient or scoped. And then in our case, what we should have is both of these services be registered as singletons. So I'm going to just add them here. So we have the system clock and we have the iWeather service. And every time we add a new one, and we want to make sure that the tests fail either locally or in continuous integration before we even deploy the code, then we're just going to be adding a new line of the service over here. And now, just so I don't bore you with implementation, a very basic way to implement validate services is like this. And let me just collapse that so I can show you. So we have the validate services method over here. We're keeping track on this iteration or whether we failed or not. And the reason for that is because you don't want to just fail for the first unregistered thing and then lose all the others. So you fix one thing, you go back, you fix one thing, you go back. So we're going to get everything in a single execution. And then we just get everything that matches the triple data. So we iterate over the descriptors, try to match the data. And then if it is a match, so if match is not null, then we continue because the service was registered and it was in the list of things we want to validate over here. But if it was, then we say that the search failed, we append the line in the text, and then we append what service wasn't registered, and we'll keep going. And then in the end, we just return the result. And now with this validation in place, the last thing I need is to actually trigger the building of the application, because these are just the instructions. So what I want to say is client, and creating the first client will trigger the build. So let's go ahead and run this. And the first thing I want to do is make sure I have both services run and then run my tests. And what I should see is a pass. So let's go ahead and see. So test runs, test successfully passed very, very quickly as well. You can see under a second. Now I'm going to go and comment out the weather service, which is the one that wouldn't fail because it's on the controller level. So I'm going to go ahead and just run this and let's see what happens. So as you can see, we have a failure. Let's look at the message. It says fail to find register service for, and then it says I weather service, weather service, singleton. And then you can go ahead and fix it because it could not find it in the DI container. I can go ahead and comment out another thing. And if I do that, then I will get both services here. So very nice message and it fails early. Now, why does this approach work? Why is it so good? Let's go ahead and make it fail and debug it. And what I want to do is add a breakpoint here in the beginning of my application, then a breakpoint in here and then a breakpoint after the building, just to demonstrate that it will never actually run or run in migrations or ever, ever start. So we're going to leave this here, then go here, add a breakpoint here, and then add a breakpoint here as well. And here, here we go. And I'm going to go ahead and just quickly debug it. So let's see what happens. So my test starts, I'm going to step over this. And as you can see, it skipped over this method over here. This is because this will be called only after I call the build method here. So we're going to go and step into this. And as you can see, now my application starts being built. So everything is registered. And then the build method is called. And now the method is called and only then I get a service collection, which as you can see, has all the services in my DI container. Here you go. Everything. Most of them are needed for uh, .NET Core itself. But as you can see at the bottom, I should have uh, my own stuff like the clock. It should be somewhere here. In any case, I'm going to go ahead and step over everything. Then it's going to try to validate. It finds that it's a failure because I haven't registered one of them. And then it will assert fail. So it will never, as you can see, go past that point. It will never run the API, making it very fast, very effective. In my opinion, the best way you can approach this nowadays in .NET 7 with this new hosting model. I believe it's a great approach to handle this sort of problem. Obviously, we wouldn't have it if we had 
compile time dependency injection, but unfortunately we can't have that yet. So for now, this will be more than sufficient to ensure that your application does not blow up on startup or when your users actually try to use it. But what do you think? Have you tackled this problem before and how are you tackling it now in .NET 7? Leave a comment down below and let me know. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreons for making this possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.